here's, here's what we're going to do for a while here. I'm going to do one thing then before we take our first break. Uh, preparation for collapse. And you notice that Jeff, huh? That's the name of the mistake. Huh. <laughs> well, you know. I know, you might, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit too negative, you know. It's like prepar preparation for paradise or creating paradise. D did you notice that, what was the title of Jeff Lawton's video? Something about preparation. Getting ready for, so it's really a hot, it's a selling point right now. Um, so I've been preparing, I've been ex I've been expecting, I've been expecting collapse for almost 40 years now. I mean, I saw, I, I saw it coming a long time ago, and I keep saying, boy, it's certainly, you know, the system's much more resilient than I would have thought. Um, and, but you can see that there's, you know, you can see it's getting shaky. Um, so here's what I personally have done. So I'm just going to go through my personal things I've done to prepare, and then. We can, then we'll look a little bit at transition towns and, and Vicki has a few things. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I, it looked particularly worrisome to me. I had $1,000 in the bank at the time. I said, oh, it's, you know, got to get this money into some real good, useful stuff. So I went to Hardwick's Tools in Seattle, the best tool store I know of, and I bought $1,000 worth of tool, hand tools. And I just read Stephen Solomon's book, Gardening in Hard Times. And, um, and he said that it was really much better to spend your money on high quality tools than cheap tools. So I took his advice to heart. So it wasn't hard to spend $1,000 on hand tools because I went for the top, top of the line uh, tools. So I bought really good spades and shovels and rakes and uh, uh, pitchforks and bars, you know, the, the kind of things, it basically gardening tools, uh, hand gardening tools, because if you can't buy gas for your rototiller or whatever, you know, you, you, I still have my hand tools. So uh, one of the things I bought, I own a couple of wood stoves. I own it, well, starting at, you know, the big stuff. I own a yurt, so I, I own a shelter. I own a bunch of Costco canopies. I can live in a Costco canopy even in the winter with a wood stove. Um, I could ha I have a few, t you know, little tents. That's really tough. I hope I don't ever have to do that. I have a one man. I have a wood cook stove. I've lived a lot of my life with wood cook stoves, not just a heat stove, but a cook stove. And I ha I bought a really good quality one man cross cut saw, so I can have shelter and I can have heat even in the winter. I can stay alive. And it's all done by hand, you know. I have um, I have a, a water filter on hand. I have, but my biggest my biggest thing I would say really, I have a lot of warm winter clothes. I made sure that, you know I was really poor in part of my life and didn't have enough socks, so now I've over prepared. Um, I have so I have a, I went out and bought a bicycle. I didn't have a bicycle. I said, I want transportation. Um, and I have what I figure is most important. I have a lot of seeds. I have a lot of plants. And, uh, and I know, and I have all these garden tools. I can grow my own food. I can grow my own food. I can supply my heat, my shelter, my transportation, uh, water. You know, I've got the basics covered. Um, and the... But probably the thing that, you know, that's the personal stuff. I mean, I do have a little bit of supplies of candles, you know, it's like, how are you going to provide light? You might go to bed early. But I'm trying to figure out how I can survive. And if I have a family at that point, my near, my near family, my couple, you know, my right close by. But really, I think that a really big part of my strategy has been to have a lot of friends. And I had a point in my life where I would consider myself a networker for the, for the Pacific Northwest. And my goal was to have a friend a day's journey apart throughout the Northwest so I could go. And I would never have to use a motel. I would always have friends to go to. And uh, I came 
I came relatively close to achieving that at some point. Um, and so it, it was uh, hard to carry around the, you know, all the three by five cards. I had three by five cards, one for each person. Um, that was before the days of computers. And they were alphabetized. And if I had to do a mailing, I would take out all the cards I wanted to do a mailing, hand address the envelopes, re-alphabetize them all in, and write down exactly everything I sent to them. If they ever sent me anything, little notes about who they were. I knew each of these people on these 15,000 three by five cards, and they were all around the country, but particularly heavy in the Northwest. Huh? Did you say 15,000? 15,000 three by five cards, yeah. Um, and that was just one of the sets. Um, but that was my big set. But the goal is, is that the bigger the network of friends you have, the more secure you are. And my, of course, I, have a, I cast a big net, the whole Pacific Northwest. But having a local network of friends is your best, is your best security. It isn't having a whole bunch of stuff and you're all lonely and, and nobody likes you. You know, <laughs> you want to have not too much stuff but, and a lot of friends. I always said I wanted to be in a community of poor people rather than a rich person sitting on a hill. So I've, yeah. I've stuck with that and I've never become rich. Yes? You also have good knowledge of medicines. Oh, I have good knowledge of medicines too, yeah. library, which I think is should all be collected. Yeah, I have those things too, yeah. Library and the, it's knowledge that you want. But it's also attitude. Uh, a lot of what preparation is just having a good attitude and being, you know, ready in an attitude-wise way. So it means, uh, what does that mean? Being, uh, that's a big one. Uh, how can you not have fear? How can you, how can you, how can you face danger without fear? I think there's a, fear is a, is a reasonable emotion in certain situations. To go in, through life with fear, always in fear, it's not a really good way to go through life. So there's times when fear is justified, but mainly we try to, so it's attitude of, of happiness, you know, can you be, attitude of, attitude of preparedness or of happiness. It's like, you, life delivers us hard times and good times. Nobody gets through life without hard times and good times. Maybe some people don't have many good times, and maybe some people don't have many hard times, but we all get some of them. And if you, 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 you can't really change the world, but you can change your attitude towards it. I'm, my goal was to be happy in life, no matter what was happening. And that's a good attitude to sort of come, you know, to work on that attitude of inner happiness. And inner happiness can be attained no matter the outward world. Um, it's really easy to be happy when things are going smoothly. It's harder when things are tough. But uh, that's something to aim for, and, and we can't teach you that in the permaculture course. But uh, it's interesting. I just read a thing the other day. It says, that, it says that it's partly our life experiences that lead us to these things, but he says a lot of it's genetic. He says some people are born happy and some people are born sad. And it was interesting that I never th really thought of it that way before, but, some, but there, there, there seems to be something to that. We can prepare on the personal basis for, for a collapse or a downturn, but how do we do it as a society? And I, I like to tell people that to, there's two main things, and one of them is, is the current transition network, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, but, the, but it's really good to go back in time. I remember when Y2K happened in 2000, and a lot of people were really worried the world was going to fall apart at that point. And, and there was Y2K preparedness groups all over the country. And some of them got all the local neighbors together and they said, Who, who's going to be the safe house? Who's got firewood, a fireplace in case the electricity goes out? Who, who's got food stashes? Who's, and who's got medical knowledge? And so they organized by neighborhood to withstand a, a disaster, an emergency. So they did an emergency preparedness uh, work and, they, and that work is very valuable. So if you could find these Y2K handbooks, it's a, it was a great sort of like a preview or a dry run is how I look at it. It wasn't for naught, even though it didn't happen. So 
transition towns. How many people know about transition towns? Is everybody almost most people? So transition town is a movement started in England. Actually, it started in Ireland by an English man, uh, and he was a permaculturist named Rob Hopkins, and Rob Hopkins uh, got together with a local towns group to come up with an emer basically an emergency preparedness plan and, and, and to go forward into the future in a good way, to become more locally self. It wasn't just emergency, but how do you become more locally self-reliant? How do you meet your own needs locally? It's just basically how do you practice permaculture as a whole community rather than as an individual family? And over the years, yeah, you got the book over there? Yeah, so over the years, he's put out a number of books. The Transition Handbook was number one, came out, and since then there's been, I think, at least one more, if not two more. And uh, I'm just trying to see if I could see the, the date when this first came out. And it doesn't look like it's going to spring out at me. Some books just, oh yeah, here we go. 2008. So that wasn't that long ago. And now there are transition groups. So then other transition groups sprung up. And there are lots of them in England, of course. But there's more and more in, around the United States and in other countries as well. So um, yeah, here's David. Um, so really worth looking at when you're doing permaculture design for whole communities is to get the transition handbooks and read those. And there's, so Vicki, maybe you want to, why don't you report on what's happening here in Missoula?